I am more than honored to be here. Uh, I um, am wearing my very best blue suit with my favorite yellow tie. Uh, my hair is uh, turning pretty much to gray. I used to like it better when it was brown. Uh, and uh, I was a reporter for years. I'm wearing uh, spectacles. And I want to say that they are basically cosmetic because uh, essentially years of glaucoma have basically robbed me of most of the vision I ever had. Now, I want you to know personally, this is an honor to be here for me at this historic occasion, and even more of an honor to be able to talk to the minister who's brought this to so much uh, of a historic moment, uh, Carla Qualtro. The, um, well, I, I guess what I want to talk to you about first, at least, is the, the, the whole business of uh, the, uh, the, the Canada Disability, Disability Benefit. But I want to say one thing before that. And that is, when we talked last, say, four years ago, you were spearheading and shepherding the Accessible Canada Act uh, through Parliament. And what it meant was that it's unbelievable four years later that you've achieved so much. And now here we are with something the disability community thought they would never see, which is the Canada Disability uh, Benefit. So tell me, how is that going to work? Um, how, who's going to be eligible? Can you just give me some expanded views about it? Well, thank you. And thanks, Craig, for taking the time to talk with me. You know, we've been such allies um, as we have been with so many people. This is really the culmination of work of, of decades of, of almost kind of stubborn pursuit of equality rights for people with disabilities. You know, we, as I said in my remarks, we, we laid the foundation with the Accessible Canada Act and we knew we had to um, obligate governments to do better. Mm -hmm. And that's the signal that was sent. And I think, you know, the disability benefit fundamentally, as I said, is a an income supplement modeled after the GIS that will be available to low income working age Canadians with disabilities because we have the Canada Child Benefit, in which has a disability supplement up until people reach 18. And then we have OAS and GIS after age 65. But in between, it, there's an incredible um, lacking of support at the federal level for persons with disabilities. And this is the gap that this benefit will fill. In fact, one in four working age Canadians with disabilities lives below the poverty line. And in Canada, that just shouldn't be the case. It's unacceptable. And that's what this benefit will aim to address, is the unacceptable kind of poverty levels that people mm -hmm. live in. Now, of course, the other pillars of the Disability Inclusion Action Plan, employment, uh, accessible communities, that will, that will give people um, opportunities as well but fundamentally right now people are facing incredible barriers and people are living in poverty and that's what this disability benefit will address. Mm -hmm. uh, will, will you have to negotiate with the provinces over this and and be very careful that they don't take whatever money they get from the federal government and just reduce their own costs. Absolutely. In fact, that's the thing that keeps me awake most nights is, is, <laughs> is understanding how we will negotiate with the provinces to ensure that everybody is better off, that, that the, the disability benefit won't be clawed back. So, you know, as we table the legislation, and actually the work is ongoing now, we're working with provinces and territories to determine how the CDB um, will interact with their, prior, their supports and services, their income support and services, and to get a commitment from provinces that it won't be clawed back. And now we have done this as a federal government before. We did it with the Canada Child Benefit. Um, we have, you know, uh, recent negotiations on child care that also provide a good model for working province by province. But let's not kid ourselves. Again, the disability community will have to help with this and really work, you know, um, to remind their provinces and territories that uh, this can't be clawed back. How, how do you decide who, what is the criteria, who receives it? How do you come up with the uh, definition to the idea of disabilities? Yeah, okay, well, it's a super uh, important and probably the fundamental question that everybody listening or watching wants to know is the eligibility criteria. And one of the things we committed to was working with the disability community and working with provinces and territories to figure that all out. What we know and what we learned 
um, difficultly, I would say, during the pandemic is there's no there's no one list in, in Canada of people who identify as having a disability or who have been determined to have a disability. Unlike seniors, for example, I could literally tell you who's 65 and older in this country, mm -hmm. and then we could do a one-time payment as, as we've done um, for seniors. But when we look to do the one-time payment in the pandemic, we have uh, we ha we know who accesses the disability tax credit, but as a non-refundable tax credit, a lot of people who would be eligible don't apply for that. We know who gets veteran affairs disability benefits. We know who gets CPP disability, but we don't have a master list of all those people, and there's duplication there. So we will be working really hard to determine that. Craig, I guess is the best way to put mm -hmm. it, um, yeah. and maybe come up with a whole different way of of figuring this out, working with provinces and territories. Uh, but in, in fact, you were saying as many as hundreds of thousands of people may benefit from this. <clears throat> Is that right? I mean, yes, that, yes. That, that, that makes this really a historic this is announcement historic. in the sense that yes. people have been asking for years and years for something like this, and here it is. Yeah, so in the early 70s, Lester Pearson's government decided that no senior should live in poverty, and that's how the GIS was born. And then when our government came into, um, uh, in, when we came into government in 2015, we declared that no child should live in poverty. And that's how the CCB was born. And it is the decisive kind of, it's the decision of our government now that no working age Canadian with a disability should live in poverty. And that's the genesis for the CDB. It's, it's that historic. Let's uh, shift now to the new language, the change in the, in the language uh, that you're dealing with and what it sort of means. You've gone from accessibility to disability inclusion. Yep. What, what's the implication there of language like that? What are you getting at with it? Well, let's go back one step even before that. When I was first mm -hmm. appointed, I was Minister for Persons with Disabilities. And I thought the message we were sending was that we had to it was about the people themselves and the disability when really I believed it was about the barriers that people were facing, mm -hmm. not, you know, people weren't broken, our systems were broken. So let's focus on fixing the systems and removing the barriers. And so my title evolved to Minister of Accessibility and we really dug in and created the Accessible Canada Act and, and focused on removing barriers. But once again, kind of barrier removal by definition is reactive. It's, it's I, acknowledging that something is, is excluding or is discriminating, and we're going to remove that and, and, and ideally try and stop those barriers from, from happening in the first place. And that's where the evolution to disability inclusion, even within our government, um, came about, recognizing that we need to design our systems and our processes inclusive from the beginning and not be this reactive you know, champion of barrier removal, but let's just not create these barriers in the first place. What is the big picture here then, uh, in, in terms of uh, government accommodation? Yeah, you know, um, the big picture is to consider the needs and interests and perspectives of people with disabilities from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So there will always need, uh, sorry, there'll always be, and the human rights lawyer in me would, will know, and you'll all know, that there'll always be a need to, a duty to accommodate and a need to accommodate, because we can't possibly take into account all the individual circumstances um, that arise when you're trying to include people. But fundamentally, we have leaned very hard in this country on the duty to accommodate. We, you know, our, our businesses, our governments have, have basically acknowledged that it's really, you know, we're gonna figure this out later, but don't worry, we have to accommodate you eventually. And what we're saying now is that's, that's no, we, people deserve way better than that, and we're gonna be inclusive from the beginning and have this, this accommodation requirement as a last result, resort, sorry, but fundamentally, let's just not lean so heavily on this. We, Canadians deserve better. Mm -hmm. What kind of pushback, if any, have you gotten from certain sectors of the society who may not, not want to see this kind of money spent, who may, may not agree with some of the regulations you're going to be required to use? Uh, are you okay with all of that? Well, first of all, I'm very stubborn, and so <laughs> I'm totally so. okay with that. But uh, listen, I think it's more that um, we still have um, a lot of discrimination in this country against people with disabilities. People's attitudes are archaic, they're paternalistic, um, and they can be demeaning. And I mean, I face it every day, you must face it every yeah. day. People make assumptions about what I can and cannot do, every single time I walk into a room as soon as they hear that I can't see. 
And every mm -hmm. single person with disability in this country faces that, whatever their disability is, that people make assumptions about what we can and cannot do or what we can and cannot need, uh, what we do and don't need. And, and I think the attitudinal piece is the biggest ongoing barrier that we face um, that really gets in the way of people being open to welcoming the creativity and the innovation and the, the, the incredible problem-solving capacity mm -hmm. of, of the community and the richness of the community of people with disabilities in this country. How do you shift uh, public opinion to understanding that uh, there is ability that it should be so important, not necessarily the disability. Look at the ability. Look at what uh, p these people can do and achieve, especially nowadays. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think we do it alone. I think it's you know we work with the disability community. Um, we we constantly are vigilant about challenging, about not accepting what maybe we would have accepted in the past. Mm -hmm. We. We try and shift the conversation um, depending on the audience. If it's if it's business leaders, I will talk about the business case for inclusion. The you know we're in a situation of labor shortages and we have this untapped talent pool you know waiting to be put into the game. Um, so it's really working working with people, bringing them along. Um, but I would say just just challenging. Mm -hmm. Assumptions. In, in fact, shouldn't the public understand that a lot of things that are good for persons of disabilities, I'm thinking of universal design, yep. are also good for the public at large. A there, there is a, a, a sort of support system there if only people would realize it. 100%. Um, and in fact, you know, it's a, a fun story I'll tell quickly is uh, even my being at the cabinet table has made, has fundamentally changed the way the government of Canada um, governs. You know, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't read the material that was given to me in a tiny print. And so the government literally moved to e-cabinet um, to accommodate my disability. But as a result, now all cabinet ministers are on this, this particular platform. So absolutely, yes, but that's not a good enough reason. You know, the reason is fundamentally the, the, the right of people to be included mm -hmm. and recognized as, as valued contributing members of society. Now, you, you hinted in those opening remarks that there is a long-term goal here. Uh, and I think you've, you, you, you call it barrier-free by 2040. Is, yep. that, is that one of the models? That's one of them, yep. Yeah. Um, but w what, what do you see as the long-term goal? What, do, what is your ideal world? <laughs> Put it that way. Um, more sleep. More time with my family. Oh, you mean in this? Oh, yeah. Um, what I yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm being cheeky, but the, there's a really important end game, and that is when every single person in this country is recognized and valued, um, is not perceived as less than, are not in a vulnerable position because they have a disability, they identify as having a disability, mm -hmm. um, and by the way, that bar is going to keep going up and up and up. So we're gonna. This is a lifelong. This is a, a countrywide, generational endeavor where we all are saying people deserve to be treated better. Okay, the, the last question is going to be about you. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> uh, you were a uh, star athlete, uh, para Paralympics, you, every, everything. Uh, you won any number of medals. We won't go through all of that <laughs> a, again, you. but did that set you up in some sense with an attitude toward disabilities that now is so much a part of what you're doing and what you've achieved. You know, Craig, I think, I mean, I was, I was a kid who struggled to be included and I was a kid who was bullied um, and I found Paralympic sport and I could tell you honestly, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for having found that system, a system that included me and welcomed me and allowed me to shine and allowed for my ability to shine through without being constantly faced with challenges and barriers. And I became fascinated with the idea that we could design our systems inclusively. Like, okay, we can do this in sport. Why can't we do this in education? Why can't we do this in transport? Or why can't we do this in employment? Like, mm -hmm. why can't we build systems that include people like me from the beginning? And that, you know, that basically set me on a course to where we are today, because I fundamentally still believe that that's the thing we have to work towards. I, I, it has been an absolute honor to sit here with you again, and especially you too. at 
what turns out to be today a historic moment for persons with disabilities. Well, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, and I'm going to need every single person who's listening to be on board with this and help, because there's, there's much to be done, but we're, we're heading in the right direction. Thank you so very much. Thanks, Greg.